As I think we're all aware of the Irish and Irish male migrants are depicted as being particularly prone to mental illness and institutionalization in various contexts that we've looked at today on the open Um And what's interesting is that this relationship hasn't really been explored in any great depth in Irish context, and I suppose that's really what our project hopes to look at, or is looking at, using the Lancashire region as a case study, looking at the period 1850 to 1921, we're trying to explore the, many of the issues that um, Leticia and uh, Marjorie paper, uh, paper actually addresses. Um, and this paper, I suppose, today will offer some preliminary analysis on the um, project so far, on this or our research <coughs> on the uh, migration of the Irish patients into Lancashire asylum system. Um, and it is preliminary. The project uh, it's a three-year project, and um, we're 16 months into it. So we've done a lot of sort of archival work. As any of you who've worked on statistics knows, it takes a while to do all the record linking to read it all together. And um, so that's the stage we're at. So I apologise for it's quite preliminary nature, but we've done a lot of groundwork. Um, now we're at last getting to the stage slowly where we can actually write things up. Um, the main focus of our work is Wayne Hill Lunatic Asylum in Liverpool. We are looking at four different institutions, but the Wayne Hill Asylum is the richest, largely because in the 1850s the Irish accounted for approximately 50% of the asylum population. It's very rich, and therefore um, the medical superintendent tended to track the incidents of Irish and, and look into those, those issues. We're also looking at another, a broader range of of records. So we're not just looking at asylum records, we're also looking at workhouse records, uh, medical officer of health reports, newspapers, etc., etc., and medical journals. So we're, we're looking at a broad range of, and one group has been particularly um, exciting, and Sarah will uh, talk about that. So, with enough ado, I'll hand over then to Hillary to start with. Thanks very much. So I'm going to try and extract a little bit from the pile of material we're acquiring, a few sort of structural points, and then um, Sarah will talk about the more juicy, qualitative uh, material. And apologies, because uh, some of these points will be incredibly familiar to a lot of you in the room. But our project is, is preliminary, pr primarily driven, of course, by migration. And we're talking about two parts to this migration process. Huge migration from Ireland into Lancashire through the port of Liverpool and then the second migration of a considerable number of Irish patients into the four uh, lunatic asylums of Lancashire. Um, Irish migration of course uh, into Lancashire escalated significantly during the famine and also remained high in the post-famine period. And in Liverpool alone, an estimated uh, 300,000 Irish arrived in the city in the first half of 1847. And already by 1851, 22.3%, uh, a huge proportion of Liverpool's population, was recorded as being of Irish Lancashire, uh, uh, of Irish origin. And I mean, the, these stories of this process of arriving in the port of Liverpool have become very familiar to us. Uh, as we've, we've read these accounts, uh, Frank Neal's book has some very evocative accounts of the, the arrival of uh, Irish uh, famine migrants, but they never cease to shock. This kind of reading about people landing on the ports, being taken to vagrant sheds, and uh, it has this kind of analogy with, with refugee camps uh, today. So these very dis deep, deep, deeply disturbing accounts. And of course, the Irish migration has a huge impact uh, on other towns and cities throughout Lancashire as well. Um, these are just patterns, show the patterns of Irish migration very quickly in 1861 and 1891. And you can see that uh, the migration of Irish is particularly concentrated uh, around Lancashire, uh, moving up to Northumberland and Durham in uh, 1861 and then the greatest concentration in 1891 shifts towards uh, Scotland. So Irish migrants to Lancashire were, were far from a homogenous group and quite a substantial portion of them um, ended up living in ordinary working class districts and included substantial middle class artisan and professional elements. But the group we are most concerned with 
particularly in the early years uh, of our project for 1840s through to the 1860s, uh, were famine Irish. Um, and the majority of these either entered low paid employment or became reliant on poor relief. Um, Irish migration was generally linked with Catholicism in public discourse, and indeed migration into Lancashire was largely a Catholic phenomenon. And it's interesting, while those that left Ireland during the famine probably did so out of uh, desperation, um, by mid-century and, and subsequent migrants, many were planning to migrate onto uh, the United States and to start a new life there. And that's a very interesting uh, aspect of this project and something which is talked about in the asylum records, the sort of disappointment of those who do not make this second step of, of the journey. Uh, many plan to move on and for various reasons uh, could not and quite a portion of these seem to end up in the uh, asylum. And of course the uh, arrival of large numbers of Irish in Lancashire prompted a series of anxieties for civil, religious and medical authorities, uh, particularly as the Irish became concentrated in overcrowded disadvantaged areas, the mythical little island ghetto in Manchester and Liverpool's cellars. And Don McCrae and, and several other scholars have talked about this, uh, the culture of anti-Irishness and this association with, of the Irish with a whole range of evils that threatened the social equilibrium of, of Liverpool and Lancashire, the rising incidence of pauperism, which was actually very easy to, to measure and demonstrate, links with prostitution, violence and crime uh, more generally. And more specifically, they were associated closely with uh, outbreaks of disease, declining wages, sectarian violence and political tensions. And these anxieties intensified during particular flashpoints such as outbreaks of cholera and typhus in Liverpool in 1865-66 and the Fenian Panic around 1867. And we've looked at quite a lot of public health records which are incredibly detailed and illuminating. And it's indeed, it's very sort of easy to map the association of diseases like typhus and cholera with the streets where, which the Irish were most likely to inhabit in Liverpool. And the MOH produces very detailed reports, uh, not only talking about the incidence of disease in particular streets and even particular houses, particular lodging houses, of course, uh, are reported on very closely, but also the sort of cultural practices associated uh, with the Irish resident in these districts. So the source of the cholera infection in 1866, for example, was identified as the wake of Mrs. Boyle on Bishpram Street, at whose funeral the neighbours engaged in the incautious orgies that still linger as dregs of ancient manners among the funereal customs of the Irish peasantry. And we have other similar comments. Um, the extent of recording, again, this is something um, well known to anyone who's worked on public health uh, in the 19th century, uh, is a very close monitoring of uh, origins of disease, so much so that you really can see which individual streets and individual houses uh, are involved in creating these large numbers in, in local ep epidemics. And these red areas on the map, they're a little bit hard to see here, coincide very closely with the areas most likely to be inhabited uh, by the Irish in Liverpool. And this is the, the typhus map in 1866, and this time in yellow. Um, I mean, we could do a mapping, actually. We do have enough material from the asylum records to do this kind of mapping. Whether there's a real value in it, it would be an interesting question. But... <laughs> I think we'd see something a little bit different. We'd see some concentrations in these areas, and of course, uh, particularly uh, linked to the, the sort of more itinerant Irish, which were very much a feature of the migration, sort of tramping Irish phenomenon, which is referred to. We may find more in particular lodging houses, because these seem to be a very dislocated group, of course, that end up in asylums. And we'd also find some in the more prosperous areas of Liverpool, because many of the 
Irish um, patients in asylums uh, were servants, so working in, in well-to-do houses in Liverpool. But it might be fun to try doing this kind of mapping ourselves. So the, the areas we're going to deal with very quickly here, um, we're going to look at Irish migration, the relationship between confinement and Irish migrants, and how much the Irish were identified as a group particularly prone to psychiatric illness, and that's something Sarah will be talking about in a minute or two. We want to look very quickly at particular management strategies that evolved to deal with high levels of mental illness amongst the Irish. And we want to look at, of course, this is the, this is the real core of our project, is looking at the relationship between mental illness and the Irish, and how much this was associated with changing patterns of migration, poverty, trauma, social and cultural dislocation, as well as degeneration, low morality and alcoholism. And again, Sarah will be looking at that and giving some more specific examples in a few minutes. And the final area we'd like to look at very quickly is the way in which concerns about the numbers of Irish patients occupying the asylums of Lancashire segued into a broader concern about the increase in insanity in the late 19th century. And one of the things we, we are doing as part of this process, we're not going to talk about that particularly here, we're trying to map of course what's happening amongst the Irish population within the asylum but also non-Irish groups. So we're trying to sort of pull out contrast between Irish groups of patients and non-Irish inhabitants of these institutions. So the Lancashire asylums, of course, were part of a bigger picture of welfare provision um, for Irish migrants. And many of these migrants did find their way into the four <coughs> Lancashire asylums. Uh, Lancaster Moor, Rainhill, which, as Catherine mentioned, is our particular case study, Prestwich and Whittingham. And it's fair to say their impact on the Lancashire asylum system, which is one of the biggest, probably the biggest in, in uh, Britain around this time, and possibly one of the biggest worldwide, their impact was absolutely staggering. Uh, they accounted for around half of admissions to Liverpool's Rainhill Asylum by the late 1850s, and nearly half of the resident population uh, by 1871. And the, the peak there, I mean, there are lots of things going on in terms of how patients were moved around the county as well as these asylums both opened and expanded. The peak there is probably due to the removal of a large number of patients into Whittingham Asylum as that opened. And then Rainhill would be able to take a new cohort of patients in, in that particular year, uh, 1874. And we're not talking at all about the private asylum system, but that is vast too in Lancashire and also has a significant role to play in, in taking in Irish patients. I won't talk about uh, these graphs. Um, the way we've presented them makes actually the, the Irish line, the blue line, look uh, less than it is. But and of course in the top one in Prestwich, uh, during the late 19th, early 20th century, they're still accounting for about a fifth of all patients. And in Whittingham, about a quarter. So although the, the proportion of Irish patients does decline, their numbers still remain substantial and are still an area, a cause of a great deal of, of concern. I'm going to skip that one, save time. So medical superintendents, not surprisingly, referred to, um, in their reports to the pressure placed by Irish admissions on what were or rapidly became um, severely overcrowded institutions. And the management of, of the patients, and this is both Irish and, and non-Irish, of course, took various forms, uh, but included the use of workhouse facilities, and included, we found a lot of evidence of patient exchanges with, with the poor law. So on the one hand, while the medical superintendents are dealing with this massive influx of patients, a large proportion of which were, were Irish, they're saying on the one hand that the asylum is the proper place to treat these patients. This is where they should be. Even those that look 
not particularly curable, should still be in asylum where they have the best chance of being treated properly and cured. It's pretty surprising. So they are keen to get patients out of the workhouse system, despite the lack of space often in asylums. But at the same time, there is this sort of creativity. Uh, they do patient exchanges with uh, poor law authorities. So if they have a, a set of patients who are deemed quite manageable, um, easier to accommodate, who perhaps don't need very active treatment, they're brought back into the workhouse system and the asylum in return will take more difficult, uh, challenging patients into their institutions. Cost has come up a lot this morning. Um, and. The, the cost of maintaining lunatics was an absolutely huge burden on, on the rates, which of course were very overstretched already with all sorts of poor relief uh, issues. So the Liverpool Guardians paid £14,000 in 1870 uh, for lunacy expenses and large portions of these costs were spent on, on Irish patients. And I won't talk at all about what is a very well-known phenomena in terms of asylums <coughs> and the pressure on them through the 19th century with or without this uh, Irish migration factor which you build an asylum it fills immediately you extend it it fills again it's a sort of ongoing process of adding buildings and annexes and adding indeed in asylums in the Lancashire context this is also replicated in, in places like London of course um, the other side, uh, John's comments about um, the hospitals were very interesting because we did see this creativity in Lancashire that steamship companies were urged, pressurised to set up a hospital as well in response to the fact they were making a good deal of money in bringing um, Irish migrants over. That was something we found quite interesting. This is Whittingham, which um, is one of the biggest asylums in Europe. Um, this is kind of the end station. This is not a good place to end up because patients very rarely left Whittingham. This is a place where the chronic cases tended to uh, cluster uh, to be sent to and they often died there. Um, there, was very, there were a few patients discharged from Whittingham. Now one problem, um, one interesting aspect of Irish admission was the, the complication of returns from America, and this was something which caused great resentment by the poor law and asylum authorities. The numbers aren't necessarily huge, but there is a, uh, there are some, and it's, it's seen as a very annoying um, aspect of provision. Some patients were removed back from America into the Lancashire Asylum system, which caused great annoyance amongst the poor law authorities and the asylum superintendents. So in 1858, for example, um, some lunatics, uh, amongst with other pauper patients, were returned from America, 90 were Irish, uh, and 17 of the 108 were lunatics and epileptics. So there is, we found that in, across all the records, quite a lot of global exchanges of, of patients, with many being sent back from America. And I'll hand over to Sarah at this point. Um, as part of the project, we've examined attitudes to Irish Im um, immigrants and Irish insanity, looking at sort of medical and official um, responses in, in journals and various reports, and also lay commentary in newspapers. Um, and obviously, we've done this to, to look a little bit at how much um, these responses and commentaries are built on, on sort of stereotypes of, of the Irish. Yet despite presenting the asylum and the poor law with huge management issues and massive costs, as Hillary's shown, responses to the Irish lunacy problem could actually be pragmatic and sympathetic, recognising the close association of insanity with stress and poverty. So in the 1856 report for Rainhill Asylum, a year when admissions were restricted to just 92 spaces due to this lack of space uh, and overcrowding, and the medical superintendent Rogers referred to the fact that one third of admissions were Irish and that this shouldn't be a huge surprise since um, a large extent of the Irish prevailed in the population of Liverpool uh, and also when it is recollected that it is the port through which more of the emigrants from Ireland to America and Australia have to take their departure and many return um, crushed by disappointment um, in a foreign land. So you can see Rogers recognising how the experience of migration itself um, affected a person's men mental well-being, particularly when they failed to settle and prosper in a new land. So a little bit uh, like Marjorie said, the, the effect of um, disappointment and, and stress. 
So although the number of Irish patients fell as a proportion of admissions and asylum populations into the late 19th century, they were perceived as both a significant and troublesome aspect of the problem of overwhelming numbers and overwhelming overcrowding. In 1901, the Lunacy Commissioners reported that the asylum population of Lancashire had quadrupled in 40 years. Uh, in that year, they'd visited the county's four asylums and 16 larger workhouses and reported, quote, the extreme urgency which exists for additional accommodation for the pauper insane of the county. And, of course, the Irish were a significant contribution um, to this growth in population and the burden that resulted from overcrowding. The commissioners also reported in 1883 that Rainhill um, had in its care an excessive proportion of bad cases, many of them natives of Ireland and turbulent in disposition, so as well as the sort of high numbers of uh, Irish patients being admitted, there's this sort of troublesome behaviour that then created management issues was an additional concern and a, de a demand that was placed on asylum resources. The annual report of Prestwich Asylum for 1884 referred to the constant problem of immigration from Ireland, stating many of these people are persons of originally defective mental organisation who are usually upset by the hardships and worries of their new life. And the medical superintendent went on in this report to state that the large percentage of cases traced to heredity was in large, measurable, large, sorry, was in large measure attributable to Irish immigrants who were attracted to the manufacturing districts of Lancashire. So again, we can see the, uh, the reference to degeneracy and, and also the impact of stress. So by the late 19th century, Lancashire was regarded in effect as an extension of the Irish asylum and poor law systems. Irish patients in particular are associated with intemperance, low morality, which we've seen described as the bad Irish character, general paralysis, incurability and criminality, with a high portion of, of um, Irish patients being transferred from Broadmoor, but we've also seen um, patients coming from more local prisons in Liverpool and the surrounding areas. And they're also associated with defective mental organisation, um, sometimes described as the failure in the race of life, which then led to breakdown and subsequently committal to the asylum. So the Irish as a patient group were perceived as problematic and a challenge to order and discipline uh, in the asylum. Yet despite these management issues, we can see again um, Rogers, the medical superintendent at Rainhill, remains a little bit positive and optimistic that patients could be managed. And he stated, although the character of a large proportion of the patients in this asylum being drawn from the Irish quarters in Liverpool is intrinsically bad and their mental conditions such as to afford no hope whatever of ultimate recovery. By the closest attention to minute details and the willing and active exertions on the part of the officers and attendants, um, a comparatively fair amount of order of the piety of behaviour has been established even amongst this class, which in itself is quite interesting. So the continued pressure exerted by Irish cases dovetailed with uh, an awareness that the increase in insanity in Ireland itself was apparently higher than elsewhere in the British Empire. And by 1884, despite population decline in Ireland, there was one lunatic in Ireland to every 214 population, compared with one to every 414 in England and Wales. And Daniel Hatchuk referred to the rates of certification of lunatics and idiots in Irish asylums between 1875 and 93, noting a rate of increase of 60% compared with 22% in England and Wales. And he goes on to attribute this to many factors, including migration of the strongest, which left those behind in Ireland more liable to lunacy as well as the return of insane emigrants. In addition, there were um, poverty, loss of land, heredity and intermarriage. Uh, similarly, Thomas Clouston asserted it is quite well known that when a primitive person is subjected to sudden change in its surroundings and has suddenly to adapt itself to new social conditions and environments, it is liable to striking consequences such as extinction, degeneration or loss of mental force. And these arguments are very much mirrored in some of the um, Irish medical journals that I've been looking at recently, in particular the medical press and circular around the sort of turn of the century, so a couple of examples from 1983 and 05. They are raising these issues of heredity and very much that the young and the healthy are left behind in Ireland. Sorry, the young and healthy leave Ireland and breed sort of strong, healthy families uh, abroad. And the consequence then is that so there's an undue proportion of defective persons left in, in Ireland. And these go on to breed the unhealthy families who add, add to the increased ratio of lunacy. So press reporting and lay commentary we've also looked at and uh, again is, is particularly harsh and reflecting on the continuing burden on the county of Lancashire in 1870, it was reported in a local newspaper that many persons in our asylums are importations. 
Um, they belong to other countries, but principally Ireland, uh, who are brought to Liverpool, then deserted and then picked up. They're placed under the requisite surveillance and kept at the expense of the ratepayers. If there had not been such an influx of this class, extra asylum accommodation for Lancashire would not, we feel confident, have been required yet. A much better system of supervision by way of preventing importations of the finest peasantry, I think that's correct, into Lancashire than, than uh, that we have now is required. We have plenty of insane people in the county without being put into trouble of keeping any of old Ireland's demented children. So we can see clear jibes at the Irish language, but also an obvious discontent about the financial implications of the Irish influx. And again, the demands that this placed on the um, asylum accommodation. But something we've also seen is that this hardening of attitudes doesn't distinctly correlate to the periods when there's a the highest influx of Irish immigrants. Instead, it comes through later um, and is connected again to this discourse on heredity. So another objective of our project is to couple the big picture um, of the impact of Irish immigration within the asylum system to individual stories of migration, employment, poverty and confinement to get a much bigger picture of the sort of migration experience. And thankfully for us, this has been facilitated um, using cross-record linkage. Uh, Hilary found this set of notebooks up in Preston at the end of a long day. And from these uh, notebooks, we've been able to get um, a little bit of information, not a vast amount, but nonetheless very important information for us giving a little bit of detail about the, the patient before their admission to the asylum. Most importantly, it gives us place of birth, which helps immensely with identifying, obviously, the Irish patients and just cross-linking um, that with um, case books. OK, I'll go, go, go. So as you can see, the, um, the notebooks came from um, a, res a, a resolution that was uh, passed in 1867 by the, Gi the General Finance Committee because they were interested in establishing settlement for the purposes, again, of cost of chargeability. And so for us, the one set of notebooks which looks at Irish, Scottish, Manx and foreigners has, has been particularly useful. I'll move a little bit quicker. So as I say, there's an example of one entry. Although it doesn't give us huge amounts of detail, it still fills in a little bit more sort of background and colour to the patient's um, uh, life, and particularly for us where we can establish um, Irish ethnicity. So cases recorded in these notebooks and then coupling that with um, case note entries and admission, uh, de uh, details from admission registers has provided an insight into individual circumstances and experiences, but it's also illustrated the defining features of lunacy. And so we begin, uh, we've been able to establish that many women have been in domestic service and many were either single or widows. Um, for example, in our sample, 46% uh, of single women um, were servants compared with only 12% of married women who, unsurprisingly, um, filled the housewife category. A large number of Irish patients of both sexes had criminal convictions, and they were often highly mobile or vagrants, moving between different areas, which are sometimes connected with employment, but also between various institutions, such as prisons, hospitals, and the workhouse. Many have been only a short time in Lancashire before their admission to an asylum, again, often via the workhouse, and many were in poor bodily health and nutritive condition. And as Hilary pointed out a little bit earlier, a significant number had been in America, and return to England. So to give you just a couple of examples that sort of encapsulate these experiences, we have Anne Buckley, who was um, sent to Rainhill in 1871. She was born in D Dublin, was single and a prostitute, and she lived in a poor Irish quarter. It was reported that she'd been drinking hard and has a very little uh, food of late. She was violent, frightened and unable to sleep. And when she was discharged, her friends were written to requesting them to take her home to Ireland, but as they did not come, she was sent to Brownlow uh, Hill Workhouse in Liverpool, so she was kind of retained within the sort of welfare system. Uh, Bridget Fennell, she was admitted to Rainhill in 1876, and she falls into our domestic sort of servant category, and again moved between the workhouse, uh, lodging houses, and the Mill Road Hospital, so she was particularly uh, transient. Sorry to go a little bit fast on these. Um, just to equal the gender balance, we've got James Gallagher, who um, was sent to Rainhill Asylum as a criminal lunatic. Uh, he'd been insane about 10 years and was suspected of having been in an asylum previously in the United States. Um, he'd taken part in uh, the War of Independence, which obviously must be an error, and we believe is the American Civil War. <laughs> otherwise, he's very, yeah, he's, he's going, otherwise he's very old. Um, so he um, was charged with attempted murder and was sentenced to a term in Millbank Prison. Um, for being um, sent to the asylum, where unfortunately he died of pleurisy. And then our final example, Thomas Benson, he was sent to Prestwich Asylum, so a slight variation there from our primary sort of case today. 
Um, he was sent in 1868 and was single aged 44. He was born in Belfast where he had no settled home and um, moved around quite extensively once he was in England going to um, Leicester and Leeds jails. Um, before he was, um, sorry, he, he was also in Fishton House Asylum and then Broadmoor Criminal Lunatic. So again, he was kind of moving around the system fairly frequently. So to speed to some kind of conclusion quite apprehensively, as I say, because we're in these early stages of really looking at all the material we've gathered. Um, what we've seen is that the various sources we're looking at tell us different things about the relative impacts of stress, migration and moral causes, but links with heredity, uh, can, with heredity, degeneracy, alcoholism, GPI, they're much more evident by the late 19th century. They're very dominant in the medical journals, asylum annual reports and commissioners in lunacy reports. And this dovetails, as we've said, with the extensive and much broader discourse about causes and increase um, of insanity in both the English and Irish contexts. Thank you.